Hi everybody. Today I'm going to talk about the story Everyday Use by Alice Walker. It is on page 410 in our anthology and it's a story that you can find online if you didn't have the anthology this semester. The story was written and published in 1973. And Alice Walker is a famous African-American writer. Her Probably her most famous novel is called The Color Purple, and it was made into a movie years ago with Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah Winfrey. Anyway, Everyday Use is probably Alice Walker's most heavily anthologized piece, and it's one of her best as well. Alice Walker um, is famous for being a Southern African-American writer, as well as coining a word that she called womanism. And back in the early 1970s and late 1960s when she get when she was getting started writing, it was the height of the civil rights era. And so womanism was a combination of feminism and African studies. So this is something that I think certainly comes up in this story. Um, several themes emerge in this story, and I'll just list some of the themes that you can think about, and then I'll go through some of the individual characters and qualities of the story. Race and culture, obviously, based on heritage through quilting, and personal pride through family and heritage. Also, poverty and class status is another theme with a life of sharecropping and farming on a southern Georgia a small farm with um, not much money versus an education an education that the other family doesn't that that her family really doesn't know anything about um, another theme is the disparity or the differences between speech and silence um, the search for identity is finally another theme as well. Just a very brief plot summary, the narrator of the story is Mama, and the other characters are her two daughters, Maggie and Dee. Dee is the daughter who's older than Maggie, and her church and family have raised enough money for Dee to go off to college. Presumably she's graduated from college already and lives away, but she originally was named after her aunt, and her aunt was named after her grandmother, and so on back through the Civil War. Dee has always felt superior to her family. We see that through the way that she escaped any harm from the fire, that she always had a superior and arrogant attitude even as a child reading to her family. Maggie was burned fairly severely in the fire and has always felt inferior in her speech and in her looks and education. So the plot is very simple. Maggie and Mama wait for Dee to visit. Dee comes, visits with her new boyfriend, Hakima Barber, because they can't pronounce his new Muslim name. And Dee asks for the quilts that her grandmother sewed by hand. Mama does not give them to her because she says she has promised them to Maggie. And Dee leaves. So the plot is very simple. This is a story that does not have a complicated plot at all, but it's a story about many different complicated themes as I've just listed. Some critics say that Alice Walker herself is closely aligned to the D. Wanjero character in the story. D has changed her name to something that she thinks is more close to her, her African heritage, which of course is ironic because D is actually part of her family heritage. Um, Walker is a black woman too who left her roots as the daughter of sharecroppers to have an education and quote make it and find a new identity separate from the poverty and illiteracy of her family. So there's a little bit of Alice Walker in D slash Wanjero. Um, obviously the story essentially suggests that we should sympathize with Mama and Maggie. Mama is the narrator telling the story from her perspective. She's certainly not unreliable. I don't think she's telling anything that's not true. I think we can rely on her. And even if we got Dee's side of the story, which we don't, 
we would still be able to see that D only wants the quilts for their aesthetic value, as well as other pieces from the house. She treats her family as if they're foreigners. She snaps Polaroid pictures of them and lines them up, basically to essentially, we assume, go back and show off her family and her her very poor, poverty-stricken roots, um, knowing that she's separate from that now. However, I personally don't think we should absolutely eliminate D from our sympathy, write her out of the story, so to speak, as she leaves, and feel total alliance with Maggie and her mother as they put the quilts to everyday use. Even if we don't feel ultimately sympathetic with D, we should see the complexity of what's happening to her. And I see D sometimes more like myself or ourselves who are reading the story because we're educated. You're actually working in college toward what D has. And so perhaps then we should see the story as a commentary on storytelling and quilting as a way of making the world and as a way of artistically representing the world. We are supposed to be in the corner with Maggie and mom, yet Dee's motives of attempting to understand her past cannot be dismissed. The very fact of telling this story suggests the place of art and its usefulness. So art can be hung, but art can also be put to everyday use. And in this instance, we wind up understanding the everyday use as an artistic object. It doesn't have to be hung. It can be both. Um, quilts today are now part of the consumerist culture, an object to be gazed and analyzed rather than used. A lot of people hang quilts as decorative aesthetic objects. Um, they're recognized as something of value in the story to be given only at a special time. So the conflict then becomes dual economic orders of the two sets of people. Maggie and Mama linked on one side value the quilts for their family tradition, passed through oral storytelling. Dee values the quilts for their representation of a new order for black people, the way they will rise up and reclaim their heritage. So, there's lots of complexity in the idea of story, storytelling, and what the quilts mean. And this is why I think we can't totally write off D, even though that's perhaps what the tone of the story intends us to do. It's just a little deeper reading into the story. Uh, Mama represents love, I think, her desire and willingness to call D by her new name. She, her love is also treating Maggie equally when she knows that the world has given Maggie a bad rap. Um, Dee, even though educated, is represented as using language and stories to oppress rather than lovingly teach. Her sarcasm, her sharp wit, her language, her ability to oppress with words lends to this vision of two kinds of storytelling. Storytelling through quilts and through heritage and through verbal passing down of stories is one way to look at it. And another way is very sharp and very um, oppressive. So language can be both. Um, ironically, here's what happens, I think. Maggie and mom find their voice through silence, whereas Dee loses her voice through speech. All of the speaking that Dee is doing, all of the reading, all of the speaking to her family, all of that doesn't get her what she wants, the quilts. And Mom and Maggie, in their silence, retain the quilts. They retain the notion of what family heritage means. Still, the complexity of this is that Mama respects Dee's ambitions and place in the world and even dreams of them at the beginning. Mama knows that her daughter will not approve of their house where they chose to live. Um, presumably after the first house burned, they've moved to different houses. At least this one that they're in now is pretty much the same as the first house. We get a description of it that there aren't even windows. There are just holes cut. Um, there's dirt on the floor. It's a tin roof. They definitely live in a very... Um, a poverty stricken environment, but it's something that Maggie and Mama don't think twice about, whereas that's what Dee is obsessed with. <laughs>
Um, Mama knows that her daughter won't approve of her appearance either as a large woman or her demeanor or her status as, quote, the man of the family. Um, no husband or father, as mentioned, which does give the story a very womanist feel. And this story is definitely a representation of the link between African-American culture and feminism and how women can achieve in ways that are beyond just being educated. Education is one way, but an understanding of family, heritage, and what everyday use constitutes is another. So anyway, those are some thoughts on everyday use. There's one more thing I wanted to say before I leave, and there are a lot of similarities, I think, between D or Wanjera, which you, whatever you might want to call her, and Benitha in A Raisin in the Sun. And that would make, I think, actually an interesting comparison for your research paper. Um, certainly Alice Walker had read A Raisin in the Sun. It was published, you know, about 15 years before she wrote this story. So that's all for today on Everyday Use. Bye-bye.